with yeah. that, some of the jokes. All right. Bye. Welcome, everybody, to the Crypto Mining Tools podcast. And today we're here with uh, special guest Jan Kapek. Let me fix it a bit. Um, my name is Jan oh, wow. Chapek. Right, Jan close. Chapek. All right. Jan yeah, Chapek. Jan right Chapek. there, guys. Right there, Jan Chapek. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and our co-host, co uh, Ethan Zerka. Um, so, yeah, we're excited today. To hey, have everybody. You. Ethan here. Yeah, we're excited today to have you, uh, Jan. Uh, thanks for having me. We wanted to uh, hear all about what you guys have been up to recently um, at Brains. It sounds like you guys have some exciting stuff that uh, has gone literally from the, the back of a napkin uh, you know, concept to now a full-fledged um, operating system, right? Yeah, tell us the story. I want to hear it. Okay, uh, so the story started somewhere around 2017 uh, when we started playing with uh, firmware for, at that time, uh, a miners called Dragon Mint. And we were actually looking at how to make that uh, machine work uh, with the current Stratum protocol. Uh, and the basic problem was, you know, adding um, ASIC boost support into Stratum protocol. It was called version rolling. Uh, so we did those changes, and it was the time where we actually started developing a, a firmware, uh, thinking that this could become something that the manufacturer could be interested in. But eventually, they turned us down with with this project. But we already had all this code base that was like the basic operating system um, running OpenWRT, which is a Linux distribution, mm -hmm. and we built a bunch of tools on top of it, and we have integrated. Um, CG miner clone that that manufacturer was using at that time. I was in you know, silicon, um, but since we didn't have a use for it, and the and the amount of Dragon Mints was uh, so small, and eventually uh, not such a good hardware, um, we actually found out since uh, people uh, or the manufacturers seem to copy from each other. Um, the, the control board was uh, very similar to what was running in S9. So we're like, OK, since we do have the project, let's give it a name and adapt it to S9s. And back in 2017, this hardware was super popular. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how BrainsOS started as, a, as an operating system that just integrated uh, the BM miner at that time. Uh, that was a snapshot of sources of BM miner, which is a CG miner clone made by Bitmain that they published mm -hmm. last time, uh, like a year or two years ago before 2017. And we started like, you know, adding patches and all the fixes that were never published to it. And the, the, and the main point was that uh, technically, uh, the firmware components for S9 were open source, but uh, for somebody to take all the bits and pieces from the website uh, and from GitHub or wherever and put it together, it was quite challenging. So mm -hmm. we were thinking, let's, let's have a small Linux distribution, which is a sort of an industry standard based on OpenWRT, and let's just make it uh, into, into uh, an open source firmware for, for miners. Uh, so that's how it started. And after a couple of releases, it took us like one year, we started feeling that the main problem is that if we want to start adding new devices, the current code base of CG Miner is so um, you know broken from from being touched from different manufacturers. And in fact, sure. every manufacturer is running their own clone of the source code. They were like, well, there's no way we can ever maintain this because we were like maintaining one clone for, for an S9 and we still had the original clone for Dragonwind. So the original Brains OS actually uh, came out with support for two major hardwares, S9s and the, and the Dragonwinds, since mm -hmm. we already had it. Uh, but we were like, okay, now since we have a baseline, we do have to start working on a, on a new uh, software component that is actually the heart of the miner and replace the CG miner with something that would be maintainable and would be easy to extend mm -hmm. with support for different backend drivers. Like back in the day when, when, when CG miner started, it was a CPU miner really. Uh, mm -hmm. And eventually it turned into a GPU miner mm -hmm. and, pe and people were developing different kernels and drivers for different setups, but it was like meant to run on a PC. So the platform was pretty much the same. Uh, this has changed quite a bit because 
uh, with with the upcoming A6, the manufacturers also started manufacturing uh, parts of the of the you know uh, the software stack that are the operating system, the bootloaders, and all these things that they somehow downloaded from the internet and started like building their own firmware images. But it was nothing standard. Um, yeah, so this is these were the beginnings, and uh, probably I don't know in 2018 we decided okay let's after one year. Uh, of development brain so let's, let's just start a new project which would be this component and we would call it VOS miner which would replace the CG miner and yesterday mm -hmm. was the day when we eventually released a public uh, stable version something that that is actually already meant to be used on actual devices we did have uh, two previews uh, mm -hmm. one was presented uh, in Baltic Honey Badger uh, in September, and one came out uh, shortly before Christmas, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But these were more meant as a as a previews, uh, you know, to show that we can, you know, handle everything. We do have all mm -hmm. the components necessary to assemble the firmware completely from 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 open source software, including the FPGA code, which is a, a for nice. example for an S9 FPGA code is a very a critical component. Uh, which is staying a small secret and, and closed source from, from the manufacturer currently. And that was actually one of the reasons why the whole ASIC boost affair came, because um, the current architecture of the miner uh, is really uh, very complex that's coming from the, from, from the manufacturer. Uh, and they are using this FPGA to actually hide away the details of the hardware, not just doing the real-time work, but it's also uh, really... Uh, doing a lot of translation work from from a stratum job to something that the chips on the hash boards do understand, which we think mm -hmm. uh, could be for two reasons. You could think, okay, maybe that's for performance, but what we did, we really simplified the FPGA code, uh, so that is not the reason. But another mm -hmm. reason is that if you make the, the this component very complex, you can hide things. And one of the things that was not documented, and you would just see small traces in the source code, was how to make it, you know, roll the version bits so that you could use for mid states and the AC boost. Ah. So this is a, a story of Brains OS and BOS Miner in um, three minutes, I would say. Yeah, wow. Well, that's that's, that's very cool. interesting to hear because uh, I I was actually working with How Long Mining uh, during that whole thing back there uh, the other year. And, okay, uh, nice. You know, so I I kind of saw the progression of. You know, working with uh, the the very first pool, which was you know, slush pool, to mm -hmm. to get that ASIC boost uh, implemented, and then there was a few other pools that that came in line as well. Uh, but yeah, so so it sounds like you've really made a lot of progress. Yeah, it's been a, a very interesting uh, year or even two uh, in this era, and I'm really happy we decided to step into it. Um, one of the reasons was that uh, we, as a pool, always wanted to extend the, you know, the, the services and extend the whole software stack. So you would start with the firmware going up to the pool, and everything is well tested and integrated with each other. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we just didn't want um, to have the standard practice saying, "Oh, if you're using our firmware, that means you cannot mine with any other pool." That, that was not the intention. Our intention, since we're, we've been in the industry from the very beginning was that we wanted to stay transparent and we do like open source. So we thought that the, um, you know, the ecosystem deserves having something very standard and mm -hmm. something that is reaching quality. Because if you think about it, uh, Bitcoin is built around open source software. Bitcoin Core is open yeah. source. It needs to be open source because otherwise people could not trust it, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, Bitcoin mining, the mining itself, is the critical part for, for the Bitcoin blockchain because it's securing it. But when you look at what is actually securing the blockchain, are you sure you know what it is? Like, yeah. do you know like what's inside of these devices? Uh, like, I mean, we had this uh, um, Bleed affair where uh, there was a, a super feature where the manufacturer could remotely control the machines, even yeah. though they advertised it as a, it's a service to the customers, but a it feature. should have been then yeah. a feature, yeah. but it should have been then advertised and like explained and you would mm -hmm. be able to do an opt-in, but I mean, without knowing. And uh, it was actually the, the snapshot of the sources that we had for, for BM Miner when we took it from GitHub, uh, you would see in the history where they actually removed the, the code uh, huh. that 
did the oh, yeah. um, control. <laughs> so wow. I, I have uh, two questions and, you know, you, you've already talked about some of it, but just to, to summarize, what does this new BOS really mean to uh, the end user, you're like like the, the miner or the mining farm. And then the second question is, what does this mean for other manufacturers of ASIC mining machines? Okay. Um, so with this release, we decided to split the product into two parts. The first part is the community edition, which is still called Brains OS. And mm -hmm. what that means is that we wanted to provide sort of like industry standard for, for a mining firmware, including all the parts. Right now we're supporting S9s, S9IJ S9 mm -hmm. and plain S9, yeah. and we're working on the 17 support. Uh, however, it, the, the, the baseline has been set. We do also support the new mining protocol or draft called uh, Stratum V2, because mm -hmm. a lot of mining farms, especially in Russia, have been calling for some security. Um, so uh, this is one of the features of the protocol, except for mm -hmm. it's more efficient. Uh, because it's binary, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't take so much bandwidth. Um, it has uh, features like this, so it's it's more efficient and uh, it is secure. So basically, you are authenticating the server that you're connecting to uh, based on uh, some public encryption key uh, that you mm -hmm. set in the in the miner, and this is the key that is actually given to you as a full URL and public published on the on the pool. So mm -hmm. this secures the connection. So this this I see as the as a big benefit for the community addition because now it's a full stack that we can say it's open source. It's also secure uh, if you're using it. Um, then the second part is called BrainsOS Plus, where we try to uh, come up with a commercial product, and that part has a, a closed sourced component, which is the BOS Miner Plus, which mm -hmm. does auto tuning because miners were calling for some you know automated settings of the of the chips. Uh, to find the optimum uh, performance, mm -hmm. uh, so we decided, okay, let's uh, let's monetize it. And since we see that there are uh, other vendors in the industry that mm -hmm. do kind of a similar thing, uh, one motivation for us, we didn't want to break their business model, like saying, okay, we're going to do like open source everything. But at the same time, we also wanted to pay for the development that has been uh, the development effort that has been put into Brains OS uh, sure. software stack. So these are the two parts. Um, uh, second part of the question uh, you mentioned was, uh, what do we expect is going to happen with the manufacturers? Um, yeah. My, uh, my dream, but uh, just taking in the quotes, is that I would like this operating system to be on every single device in the, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, probably it's not going to happen, but... Um, First, we want to provide a reference implementation of V2. So technically, if a manufacturer wants to um, port or adapt a V2, yeah, take that they and could, clone they, that into they, theirs. Right, yeah. they, could, they, could, they could just uh, clone this. But I want to point out it's uh, a GPL uh, with small condition because we wrote the software from scratch. So we can set the license. Uh, so the BOS miner itself is, is GPL. So if, if any manufacturer decides to um, take it and clone it and fork it, we will be very happy to uh, accept their merge requests so or pull requests on the, on the GitHub mm -hmm. um, so that they could you know uh, keep the license uh, and not break the license, uh, which kind of became also an industry standard. There are not mm -hmm. too many manufacturers out there that would be like properly publishing the sources. Uh, of uh, their work, but we do all know that they're using a lot of components that are simply sure. GPL, including the Linux kernel, which they don't publish, mm -hmm. which I think uh, is a violation yeah. of the licensing. I mean, I, yes. I have no like personal uh, motivation to do any kind of like legal uh, hunting or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so, so just um, a, a few months ago, uh, a guy named James Hilliard who has made a lot of con contributions to CG Miner, actually was able to get uh, websites like Amazon to stop allowing people to sell uh, S9s for a period of time mm -hmm. uh, because he he claimed that he was uh, you know the the author or copyright um, holder and uh, so that was kind of interesting you know he. Uh, 
was playing around with that, try, trying to look for ways to uh, prevent a company like Bitmain from having that that um, advantage uh, and being able to use this open source software without uh, uh, dealing with with the licensing. Um, so yeah, that, that was that was yeah, an interesting thing uh, back then. Now that you're talking about this open source, um, you're saying that you would ideally love for all manufacturers to put this on their miners. Um, what's what's the main reason why manufacturers wouldn't do that? Uh, they would be losing control. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if I was a manufacturer, I would have to decide if I want to lose some of the control because now they if they if they keep their own policy, uh, like let's look at what's minor, for example, uh, so that we just don't talk about Bitmain. Uh, mm -hmm. Their machine is like completely closed. I mean, you you don't get a serial console on the on the latest hardware. You just you cannot log into it easily. Or actually, there is an SSH access, but um, you don't have the root access. So you mm -hmm. you know you cannot refresh it if you wanted to. Um, they most of the companies do explain this. Oh, we are protecting our customers uh, so that they don't cause any harm to you know to the to the machines. Mm -hmm. So that we can actually, uh, so that they can qualify for the warranty. But the problem that I see in this, I do understand it, but it's sort of like jailbreaking your phone, or it's it's a mm -hmm. common practice on on Android. If you buy a new phone these days, you can actually when you when you uh, reset to recovery, you can actually jailbreak it, but it just says you are losing all your warranties, which is questionable if how, how legal this is, but you have mm -hmm. an option, it's your decision that you are doing anything that you want with the device. Whereas with this mm -hmm. uh, case, it kind of sounds like as if you had the device leased, not, but not uh, you know, purchased. Yeah. Are you renting so, the, the, the miners for yeah. the price? I'm not sure about it. There, right. there have been many laws um, evoked. There's the right to repair law in the United States that have, that have challenged this. Um, producers like Sony, I don't know if you've heard about the Sony PlayStation, but you used to be able to jailbreak the PlayStation and put a, a custom operating system on the Sony PlayStation. And in doing so, when Sony found out, they actually sued the person who did this, but they lost because the guy has a right to repair and he does have total ownership. So the courts have affirmed that when you purchase a device, you are in fact the total owner of the device and you do have a right to modify and change it how you see fit. Now, if your modifications or changes do break something in the device, it is up to the manufacturer to prove that your changes and your modifications caused something to break. And upon proving that, then they can deny your warranty. But the burden of proof is on them. It's not on you. Hmm, interesting. Um, hmm. Maybe the, the, the difference here yeah, is that the, the, the big farms, they they want to keep their uh, purchase contracts right so if mm -hmm. if they kind of try pushing the manufacturer in this position uh chances are they may not be able to get the next batch of, of the devices so um uh, it's it's like a two uh two-edged sword right you, you i mean from like ethical and moral perspective things are very clear everything open source uh, i want full access i want to play with it everything but at the same time uh, there's people who want to do business and it it goes down more to the point that you don't have such a big choice of uh, the brands, right? How mm -hmm. many different, you know, minor brands can you buy uh, that you would trust that they are like, that they are competitive enough and that they're kind of like reliable and not too sure. many. So it goes down that the manufacturers do uh, guard their intellectual property very, very strongly and they believe that something could, uh, um, you know, escape or whatever could be discovered that uh, might help their competition. But on the other hand, you, you, I'm sure that the competition just knows all the bits and pieces of, of uh, you know, of the other competition. So it kind of doesn't make sense in, in, from this point of view, but this is how it is. We're trying to straighten out at least... Uh, the software part, basically saying mm -hmm. there is an alternative that if you don't want to trust the the original firmware or you have other you know concerns, you want you know have tuning or whatever, 
um, here is an alternative and you can try it and see what happens. Well, it, it goes yeah. beyond that. It's, it's, you know, you are a, an enhancement upon what was initially, you know, put into the device. So the initial firmware, you know, I'm sure there were many compromises made one way or another, either to retain control or, you know, to, to have something going on in the background that they don't want you knowing about or whatnot. But what you are, are you're a, you know, a no nonsense alternative that will give the users or empower the users to really stretch the legs of the machine and get everything that they can out of it. That was also uh, the motivation where we started digging into the async booth back in, back in 2017 when we started with the distribution. Um, mm -hmm. When I first looked at it, this is actually a very interesting story too. Um, I was like, okay, so there's people who claim on Bitcoin Talk that they can do ASIC boost, but for some reason they cannot use it. And since the mining, mining configure extension was already in place, so it was just easy to use it, I started mm -hmm. digging into in the sources and I would see like small traces like where you could enable something called like, I don't know if they call it even mid-states, maybe like four mm -hmm. mid-states. Mid-state is a buzzword, uh, it's a special term, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a state in which your SHA function is. So basically the way you provide a work to the miners, you have to mm -hmm. provide the first stage of the SHA calculation that you make on your computer. So on the CPU, mm -hmm. on the control board, and then you ship it with some remaining parts of the Bitcoin block header. Mm -hmm. And if you actually ship four mistakes, except instead of one, um, that's where the AC boost comes in place because the chips actually can share some calculation when they're trying to find the nonce, which is, uh, convert it into uh, saving the energy because they are not sure. using all the gates. So that is the trick. And when you are trying to discover like why this doesn't work, you're like, okay, so it shouldn't be that easy. So th sorry, it's that difficult. So yeah. we enabled it, uh, and we were like surprised that okay, so we see an immediate like uh, drop in energy uh, consumption by the claimed. Uh, amounts and the internet, which was like with four mistakes, it was 13% immediately, but mm -hmm. the results were broken. They were like, ah. uh, they were not valid uh, shares in terms of Bitcoin protocol. And that was the reason I was like, okay, but this stupid FPGA, which was standing between your CG miner and the hash boards was doing some weird magic that was just, you know, the result was that the the shares mined by the by those hash boards were not valid. So like, okay, let's find out if we can configure the, the FPGA. But it's like a black box and you're like trying to pull like random strings. And mm -hmm. I mean, you were like, this is a complete waste of time. Let's start our own initiative. And we're like, okay, we're gonna write open source FPGA. And that's when we started with the idea of we also want to write a new mining software because we didn't want to integrate this support into the old software. And we published a report on this and within a week, uh, Bitmain would publish a new firmware that mm -hmm. would support it right away, but yeah. they actually had a bug in it. So when you install the firmware, it would not <laughs> mine again correctly, but we, took the, FPG, we took the FPGA uh, binary code uh, into and plugged it into Brains OS because we've been using it as a component, as a black box. And mm -hmm. immediately we had AC boost. So technically, the Brains OS was the first uh, working firmware in the world that would you know, work with uh, uh, S9 ASIC boost. Well, the question is uh, if they already had it fixed. They fixed it within like three, four hours, but I was like, whoa, yeah. what the fuck? I mean, they... they <laughs> so this, th these are like all the interesting insights uh, about about uh, researching uh, all the different, the hidden features. But as far as I know, uh, after our research, um, we don't know about any hidden, more hidden features in NS9. So there's no magic okay. switch that would no, turn no it more, into... No more Easter eggs no, to, uh, yeah. to dig up. No. Tell, us, tell us about the, the newest generation gear, the S17. I know that you, you said you've, you've had a little bit of work. Have you found any Easter eggs or anything interesting going on with the newest generation um, gear? <laughs> okay. Um, we uh, we were looking at the at the evolution of uh, starting from S9K to S11, S15, and S17. I'm mm -hmm. skipping the T versions; they're like slightly different, but uh, at the same time, they they differ mostly in the hardware layout and the number of chips and how they control power. But 
generally the miners are the same. Um, so I was kind of hoping that there would be like more mid states and the, the the stock firmware would be using not like instead of four just two, but mm -hmm. that also didn't happen. So all the all this all the recent equipment uses AC boost from from day one. Okay. Uh, there's there's one hardware on the in the line. I think it's an S15 that only has two two mid states. That, so that was the one I was hoping for to have four, and uh, the the stock firmware will be using only two. But that's also not the case. So I I don't have any. Um, or we don't have any any indication that there is something magic, but well, let's see what happens. Sure. Uh, but what I'm seeing is happening very strongly, as that the manufacturer is like taking away the the control from the users as much as possible. Um, sure. Originally, S9 was very uh, easy to be hacked because it would accept pretty much uh, any uh, firmware image that you feed it with. Which is not sure. very nice. I mean, it's like if yeah. you, if you take your Apple and it would just uh, install any a random application that you download on the internet. Yeah. No, you it could should brick have some it really signature. easily. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it's not even more about bricking. But there are viruses out there that yeah. actually know quite a bit about the control board, and you think it's a magic, but it's not so much magic. They once you have the virus inside. Uh, it changes uh, some settings of, of the of the control chip uh, on the miner. It would just stay there forever because any even if you boot it from from an SD card and like refresh it with other firmware, when you do next cycle of of uh, you know when you it do, just do reloads next cycle, as soon as you reboot right, it, it reloads yeah. right away because yeah. it's in a section of the flash memory that is like locked, so it actually locks it forever. Uh, I never, we never had a board like this. We just know the reports from the miners, and we're like, we're, we're like super desperate. So they would like literally take BrainSoft SD card, put it in the miner, they would boot it, and they would hit the install to NAND, which uh, or install to flash memory. I don't know what it's called exactly, um, and. They would not have any result. It would just come back <laughs> with the with the virus again. So yeah. things like this were dangerous. So manufacturers started protecting from this by signing their firmware, which is perfectly okay. But mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, still the, the the user is not able to like disable this with uh, Brains OS. We took the same path. So on a on a system level, it works like a regular Linux distribution. So all the packages that we provide for the firmware itself is signed. So it would refuse to upgrade for from an unknown, uh, you know, from an unknown source. But mm -hmm. at the same time, if you want to add this unknown source of, of firmware into your miner, or if you just directly load it in there because you have SSH access, you are free to do it. But it is your act that you agreed upon. It's not mm -hmm. that we as brains or flash pool have decided. Oh, nobody is able to do anything with the distro. So. This is a little different philosophy where you're trying to hide uh, user safety and security uh, sure. you know, behind acts like this, where you're actually preventing them of uh, exercising the total ownership, how you call it. Yeah, uh, um, you know, it, it's always a balance. Do you have any suggestions that um, can be done to help create that balance to enable users users to unlock their machines and have the freedom to do what they will, but also you know, have a preventative or a stop gap measure there to prevent, you know, viruses from easily infecting the hardware. Well, uh, I think it's a combination of these two of these two techniques where you want the system to be robust and you want the system not to have any security holes. So you want encryption, you want digital signing, mm -hmm. uh, you want all these things uh, to be present in the system to protect from uh, viruses and, and things like this. But at the same time, you want to allow the user, if he wants to, to override such things. Like when mm -hmm. you work with a regular operating system, you work, I usually work as a, as a regular user. So uh, yeah. chances are that any uh, you know tra Trojan horse is going to get installed into, into my system is not uh, very probable because I don't work as an administrator. But at the same time, if I want to do maintenance, I change my identity to Mm -hmm. to an administrator mm -hmm. account in Windows, Linux, it's all the same, and then you make the changes. So people are used to this from, from regular environments, and uh, same thing applies to the embedded devices. 
okay. at the same time, um, you know, the mining farms are a little different in, in, uh, in that, that they should have network security. I mean, if anybody physically infiltrates the network, they can pretty much do anything. Um, now with Stratum V2, uh, technically, yes, the miners uh, are less uh, susceptible, susceptible to uh, man in the middle, so it's difficult to, to, to hijack shares. I've even sure. heard in China you can buy like dedicated boxes that you just plug in between the mining farm and uh, and you and, where, and those yeah. boxes would just do the rewriting of it the, and they they do it uh, uh, in a smart way so they're not like stealing like hundred percent of your shares but so they're uh, just just siphoning off um, yeah 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 yeah, yeah siphoning off from from the huge farms that's crazy I mean, if you're losing like two percent you would never notice right yeah it, on, a, on okay, a farm so you know on variants. a 200 megawatt farm if you lost two percent you would just think ah oh, it's a bad hash day you know <laughs> like. Right. Oh, we um, had some outages. Dan, right? <laughs> we're we're gonna uh, we have a few minutes left in this show, uh, and I want to try to open it up for some questions from people that are, are listening right now on YouTube. Um, but in the meantime, can you just tell us a little through the difference between Brain OS and Brains OS Plus, and and really uh, kind of explain some of this for some of the the beginners? Okay. Um, I will open the list as well so that I can go one by one. Um, okay. So I think everybody's got a pretty good understanding of ASIC boost. Um, basically it just keeps, um, in, instead of having to repeat work from scratch, it can continue or carry over, um, some information from each block solve to make the next solve more efficient to use less energy. Right. Um, auto tuning. So this is the feature and, and, that we um, wanted to use. Auto tuning. Yeah. So that that's going to be that's on. It's the, only going to be in the so plus the, version. It's it's in the plus version. Yeah, that's the corporate version that has some IP of us that we use, and technically, uh, part of the algorithm uh, is also served by uh, by. Uh, Flash pool itself, so mm -hmm. it's like a distributed thing in a way. Um, the auto tuning can be used uh, in um, for two reasons. No, uh, you just um, the conversion from from BOS uh, community edition to BOS plus or Brains OS plus uh, is a matter of installing a single package. That's part okay. of the distribution of the open source distribution as well. That would do the conversion, and we also allow uh, conversion back to the open source uh, edition. That's okay. uh, very seamless, I would say. Um, so when you with the auto tuning, so uh, you can also you either uh, shoot for pool fees is is interesting. Right. This is this is the uh, this is the selling point in a way that we uh, we have the dev fee. But we're willing to give away part of the dev fee uh, uh, as a rebate uh, to the uh, pool fee. So if you use Brains OS, uh, you can mine with any pool, and you can use uh, uh, any features that you like. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you uh, connect it to some other pool, uh, you're not eligible for this discount. Uh, if you mine with okay. us with Slush Pool, uh, you're able to get a discount on the on the mining fee. That's that's a very awesome. interesting option. Yeah. Yeah. And in and a, in a sense, a it, it would almost option. it would almost pay for itself because of the savings that you right. would make in the pool fees over time. Right, and plus the uplift that you have in the performance uh, that should. You pretty much should not notice that you're paying a DEFI because you have mm -hmm. an uplift of, of the performance. Uh, and at the same time, you're also getting the discount on, on the pool fee. Uh, preheat. Uh, preheat is uh, yeah. a feature that people uh, who live in uh, cold climates uh, do ask for. Is that, that basically sense. the right the, the firmware, uh, when it's running, um, it has to run on a, on a preheated PCB. Uh, the 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 performance of the chip, even though you would say think, okay, let's just you know put it in immersion cooling or liquid nitrogen or whatever, mm -hmm. that's nope. the best condition. But it is not mm -hmm. the exact case. And actually, no. uh, the chips at these technologies do require certain like working temperature. Mm -hmm. um, so 
in, specifically in these cold conditions, even the, the tuning itself can start only if, if your miner reaches a temperature, a target temperature that you configured, and then we only start doing the tuning cycles. So the preheat option is, 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 is exactly meant for this case, and it's mm -hmm. an automatic thing. So basically, uh, whatever setting you have in your configuration, uh, when when it starts tuning, it would always make sure that you have the, the desired target temperature before, before it moves further. That makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question about so immersion. Have... Um, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, would, was your OS work well in an immersion environment? Yeah. Uh, it's ready for the immersion environment. And the reason is that uh, there's a simple configuration option where you specify the minimum number of fans that should be uh, present in the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, this feature is there actually to uh, make sure that the, the miner is not going to get damaged if it boots and, sure. and the system doesn't see the fans being you know spinning. But in immersion cooling, this is a different situation. So all you do is you say, uh, my minimum number of fans that I need is zero. OK. That's so it's ready good. for immersion cooling. And you disable the, uh, we have like a speed control algorithm in there that you know regulates the fan speed depending on the target temperature. All right, so yeah, we have a question here from Rico Liberty we, Report. Yeah. Um, uh, he says, yeah, yeah you're, you're fading out, Scott. He says, does um, Jan have any comments on how layer one's doing their approach to their new mining project with full vertical layering from the ground up approach. I notice more projects want less middlemen. Um, I do see this uh, as beneficial because essentially this is kind of uh, what we are trying to achieve with Brains OS, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're trying to uh, provide uh, a firmware that runs uh, on the physical hardware and that is well tested and integrated with the mining pool so that you don't have to like hunt bugs and ghosts in, in the system. Um, sure. So what we were seeing from layer one, this is kind of a similar uh, similar activity where you know ideally people want to like operate all these things completely standalone. Um, at the same time, when I look at, at like how much uh, work and what is the scope of the project that we really had to undergo, including uh, the mining protocol in order to secure uh, the mining a little bit more. Um, it is difficult to be uh, an expert in, in all the areas. So you sure. always have to pick uh, a specific domain that you uh, think is uh, the best place for you to be at in terms of uh, you like what you're doing and you think it's useful and you can survive uh, so that means it's providing you some revenue. Sure. So that's why, for example, we're never, uh, people sometimes ask you, oh, by the way, we have these megawatts here. Do you guys want to build with us some, some facility? We're like, well, no, we're not interested that much because uh, we basically, this is not our region of uh, competence, but we can support like any mining operation. Sure. We, can, we can help them with the software, but we, like the physical operation of the, of the facility is simply a different sport. Um, yeah, which absolutely. I'm not saying it's not possible to expand to these areas, but sometimes it's good to stay focused uh, in a specific field that you think is uh, the one that you're good at. I, I definitely think you are staying in your element and, and what you're strong in. And, and I can totally agree with you. You know, um, just stay with what you know, stay with what works. All right. Uh, is there any way you can share with our audience uh, your contact information? So in case our audience would like to reach out to you and, uh, you know, continue a conversation. Yeah. Uh, my Twitter handle is Jan Brains. Uh, I have the same handle also on Telegram. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, if okay. anybody wants to check out the Brains OS, just go to brains-os.com. And you can choose between the plus version, which is the, you know, the tuning one or between the uh, community version if you want to check out the open source parts. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, a very exciting episode with you. Very, very informative. Um, you are a wealth of knowledge and, and just amazing in um, how you were able to come up with, you know, understanding that CG Miner, it started out 
uh, originally designed for CPUs and people have done little patches and fixes and, and try to evolve it in ASIC, but you just said, no, we've got to start from scratch. We've got to do this better um, from the ground up and kudos Great. to you for doing that. Well, thanks to hear that. Uh, but as I say, it's uh, it's been a lot of work uh, of the whole team. All right. I think that's going to uh, conclude our podcast for today. Uh, I think Scott's had uh, some technical difficulties. So I'm just going to say goodbye to our audience this time. Thank you again, Jan. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring you on uh, at a later time and another show when you have more information and, and uh, you know show us some new innovations with the S17s or the S19s right. that are it, now coming out. It, it should be coming in the upcoming month. So it was my pleasure being on your podcast. All right. Thanks a lot, y'all. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye, guys.